It was Grande Juve on Tuesday night, and it was an amazing Borussia Dortmund on Wednesday night. Both, well, Dortmund are now through. It's up to Juve. This is Sports Tonight Live, and this is the World Football Show. If, like Chelsea, you thought one Italian is too many, then you're about to be disappointed because I'm Mina Rizuki and I'm joined by uh, European football expert Tancredi Palmieri, Buonasera. another Italian. Where are you hiding the Juventus scarf? <laughs> eh? Are you just putting this uh, fantastic outfit so we can't spot uh, you where know, there is the Bianconeri <laughs> stuff? I wanted to wear a whole black and white outfit, ah, yeah? <laughs> but then I just thought that was kind of pushing it. But I also love Chelsea. You know that I supported them si, last si, season si, for si. the Champions League. I also League. like Chelsea. No, they are. They're my English team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, just so because... you suffered on Tuesday, yeah? No, I didn't. No way. When it comes against Juventus, there's no other team I want to win. But but um, let's talk about that game because I think a lot of people thought Juventus were very good the first time round because they managed to get two goals back and everything speaking, uh, you know, they did a great job. But this time it was, there was something about Juve that was like they recaptured the essence of them last season, you know, it was back to the intensity, the pressing in all areas of the pitch, that aggressive high tempo game. And you saw the best of Vidal, uh, you saw the best of Asamoah, and of course, you know, the defense that was just left at the back to do everything whilst everyone else pushed forward. It was an Antonio Conte team. Yeah, Antonio Conte, because when I was there in the stand, I was at the, at the game, in the press box, you said that he covered the, the good things of the last season. Yeah. Honestly, I've seen the good thing of the Marcello Lippi Juventus in 95 96, mm. the one that won the Champions League, the one where Antonio Conte was on the pitch. I've seen the same hunger, not a surprise, but I've seen the same 90 minutes focusing, but even the same capacity to convert, even if until. Uh, the minute number 60, they just scored one goal and they wasted a lot of chances. But honestly, Juventus was all over. It reminded me so much the Juventus of Marcello Lippi in 1996. And I was thinking, can this Juventus, I don't want to anticipate too much the topics, but can this Juventus really be like that Juventus in 1996? And what's the conclusion? The conclusion was that that Juventus had in front, Vialli, Ravanelli and Del Piero. And here, Quagliarella took 44 minutes to play close to the edge of the box to just bounce one Andrea Pirlo yeah. shot. That you know what? Influence. That's what it is. I wrote, I wrote a column for ESPN and I said that they're one striker away from absolute glory because they have a wonderful midfield. One and great a, striker away from absolute glory. One great, glory. one world-class striker. I mean, yeah. had they had the likes of Robin Van Persie, Falcao or whatever in front of you. Falcao, we too, we can make a, a team with imagine, Falcao. But imagine if you Champions had League. someone of a great level playing up top, then this is this is a team that's literally one striker away from absolute glory. Much like Shakhtar, one goalkeeper away from a lot of, uh, a lot of trophies as but well. But see, you know, one Falcao, one Van Persie, you really can't sign them. They they, they never had the, the money or the real intention to sign them, uh, I mean, to, put, to have the budget for that. But maybe you don't need just one Falcao. You don't need only one Falcao. Maybe it can be what was the Ravanelli in 96, that was uh, the guy who just came out, wasn't the Falcao in that moment. So maybe even a Llorente that is so rumored to come close. Because seriously, for yeah. the first 40 minutes, I was saying, what a waste of uh, good playing. Oh, both the forwards, Vucinic and Quagliarella, they were never coming close to the box. And I saw at least four or five, ti four or five, ti four, sorry, or five times the crosses coming from the flanks or good passes in from Pirlo and nobody was in the box. You had to be in the box to score. Well, Marquisio was in the box, Vidal was in the box. Very, but Marquisio very few. I think with Vucinic, as much as he missed a lot of great attempts at goal, I, I think what he does is he makes everyone around him a much better player. He adds creativity and he adds balance. If he was to be played alongside a great player, now from what I'm understanding and for the rumours that I've heard speaking to uh, people in Juventus, I know that Hunter is now on the, on the agenda. Yeah, but they were, honestly, honestly, Would they if get the him? problem was the budget and the money for that, so again with Untelar will come the same problem because Untelar is someone that would come, is someone that uh, is rumored at Schalke to sign a new contract for something like 7 or 8 millions of euros. That in Italy means 14 or 16 millions of euros because you have to double because of the taxes. So they, they didn't make it in, in summer, they do it now. 
We never know. But let's talk a little bit about Chelsea. Now, you know, it, it's a shame for Di Matteo and everything. And a lot of people were saying about, oh, if they started with Fernando Torres, if they started with anyone they wanted to, that was a very difficult Juventus team to overcome. But do you think his tactics, and to be honest, he was, you know, had they converted those three counterattacks, we would be talking about a very different so, result and Di Matteo would be a hero, yes? But unfortunately for them, they didn't manage that. And everyone now is talking about Di Matteo's tactics. He was wrong to have started without Torres because Torres is, is apparently a revelation in goal scoring. Mm -hmm. So is that a little bit unfair on him? I mean, he was missing his... his experienced leaders on the pitch and you just saw a side that exactly. sort of didn't have the mentality and that hunger That's to go point. through. I mean, you, no can't, you can't take away from the Chelsea. They, they said is th they are the reigning champions. You can't take away in the same time from Chelsea, Terry, Lampard and not say Drogba. Because Drogba, of course, Drogba yeah. is the heavy impact uh, of, a, of a winning spirit in, in Chelsea. But you just can't do without them. We talk about the counter-attack, the attitude of Chelsea it was a bit weak, I must say. More than the tactics, eh? even if the, the, the peak of Aspilicueta was disaster, I mean, Asamoah completely, uh, completely see, undone. I don't agree, but look at Lichstein, he had free reign to do. If he, if he was a better player, he would have converted those opportunities. I think actually, I don't think that that was a bad idea. I disagree. The idea maybe could have been good. No, and I think he stopped. The, the minute I he was went there, off, Asamoah assisted. Uh, the, I, whenever, yeah, but that is not the point. I mean, I saw, I focused on uh, Aspilicueta and Asamoah for all the time on that side of the pitch, and every time the guy didn't know what to do because uh, he's supposed to be uh, a, a fullback and he was play he was supposed instead to play there uh, as uh, the, the, um, the midfielder just on the flank and so he was just trying to help uh, the peaks of Di Matteo weren't maybe that good but you can't say oh if there wouldn't be Fernando Torres because how many times Torres was a disappointment in the great games so well, are we telling us that all in a sudden Torres would find finally the personality to perform yeah. in this game but I do agree that he would have added a focal point but I do want to move on as well to Norshall and Shakhtar because <laughs> Luis Adriano was perhaps the most hated man in football on Tuesday night. And now, still, you, I guess still, it's something that will stay in his career. Now, if you don't know the story, basically, Norshallan had gone 1-0 up and then, you know, the referee had blown the whistle to, to, to throw the ball in the halfway line. Luis Adriano didn't seem to think that basically he, the ball was going to be passed back to the goalkeeper of Norshallan. He instead decided to just take it, round off the defenders and shoot and s score. Meanwhile, they allowed Norshallan to go on goal and just score freely. When they were going to score freely to equalize, to get another goal, he ended, they ended up coming up against a Shakhtar defender who actually tackled and, and intercepted the ball and took it away. So what do you think? Bad behavior by Shakhtar or are they right to have not let Norshallan just score a goal according to the UEFA rules? According to the UEFA rules, uh, well, there was... Uh a reporter from the Danish TV, actually the sideline reporter, that said that Lucescu, Mircea Lucescu, the Shakhtar manager, after that, Shakhtar, that Luis Adriano scored, said to some of his players to let them score. Oh, Even yes. if we, s we look at the second goal of North Shelland, and it's not that they are just standing and let the people go through, but there are different ways to let people team, score yeah. and these are very professionals they are not kind of, of amateur so if you look at that yes they try but there is no one really that is like uh, uh, sacrificing himself for that of course uh, we can debate uh, a lot but i stick to that uh, that uh, this danish uh, reporter said uh, and Mircea Lucescu is a true gentleman we s we still can't say if uh, he did it or not, and this is, uh, I tweeted about that, uh, this is what a true gentleman does when he's doing some favor to you, you don't realize that, he just puts you in the most comfortable situation because this is, was, uh, a this is what a gentleman is. So is this now your, your role model, yes? <laughs> you, UEFA have confirmed that Adriano will face disciplinary action after they ruled his goal was against fair play, and about right too. Um, Shakhtar, though, the only team <laughs> to have qualified so far from that group. Group E, probably the toughest group now, when you look at everything that's going on. Deserved? You mean uh, uh, Shakhtar uh, deserved? Do they deserve to be the first group to have qualified out? Wow. First team. Wow. I mean, in my opinion, of these uh, five first fixtures of Champions League, they are the second best team that we have seen so far. I would put... Shakhtar is second, Juventus is third, 
So, who's, who's so way to not understand who is the first one. Well, I, I think we know. But I mean, uh, when we talk also about uh, Di Matteo, the reigning champion, well, he was uh, being the reigning champion wasn't so lucky to pick a, a group where two of the best five gr uh, teams are there, Shakhtar and Juventus. I mean, in the best moment, because Champions League is a question of moment. You can be in a great shape in, uh, in November and then be nothing uh, in, in March. And Shakhtar and Juventus have been all over. Now, it's interesting you say this because Shakhtar, Juventus and perhaps Borussia Dortmund are a team that plays sort That's of, you know, heavy, uh, yes, of course it is, <laughs> you know, pressurizing football. They're very much of a team unit. There's a lot of pace going on. Now, we didn't, that's not the way that Barcelona play. So we don't know whether the tide is turning and now this is the type of football that seems to win um, you, in, in Europe at least. Now, Barcelona sealed their win. They're obviously the first to qualify out of their group um, with a 3-0 victory over Spartak. Minus Four. five to Gerda. Pa poor Unai Emery. First time we saw the centre-backs back in Barcelona. Pizzo, yeah. yeah, it was nice to, to have them back there. Now, what about second place? Can Celtic do it? I think it's like sort of the Cinderella story, like Apua last season. It's like everyone wants Celtic to go through and ah. they really deserve it, you Correct think. me if I'm wrong. They're playing at Deluge. No, no, they're playing in... Um, they host Spartak. They host, they host Spartak, yes. With nothing and, to play for Spartak. And Benfica is playing in Barcelona. Yeah. Now... And even with the second Spanish string Barcelona side. Spanish never concede. Spanish never say, okay, we are already done. We'll let them well, especially. Well, this is the Barcelona side that lost to Celtic with their first team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying uh, they never concede. This Benfica is not extraordinary. Eh? No. It's not extraordinary. Probably if Celtic would have had 50% of the rage that they had, uh, that they put on the pitch at the Celtic Park against Barcelona, they probably would ship a point uh, from Portugal. Um, can they make it? Can they make well, this is it? I thing. say yes. You say yes. Because Spartak I think Moscow, so too. I, don't, I don't believe at all in Spartak Moscow. Me because, too. Uh, uh, Unai Emery, I don't understand why his defense is, uh, is really absolutely nothing, I no. must say. Ridiculous. So it doesn't look like his defense. When he was a uh, uh, manager of Valencia, he was probably the, even a better defense than Barcelona Real Madrid one, mm. but not reliable at all. Unless you said Cinderella, so it's uh, the Cinderella. You know, part. you kind of hope so. People are saying that perhaps, you know, on this occasion, there's, you know, benefit uh, Barcelona won't put out their first play. But obviously, with Lionel Messi trying to, to chase Gerd Müller's record and trying Minus to get as five many goals, together. so you think that he will basically play anyway, regardless of whether or not Absolutely. he's playing with the likes of Teo or until whatever. Until he doesn't have the record, uh, he won't stay out. Uh, he cares. He really cares about this record. Let's face it, he got everything. He's gonna have... But I thought he doesn't want individual victories, he just cares about the team. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because he's a martyr for the cause. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. As opposed to, of course, Ronaldo. And if you, and if you go to Barcelona and <laughs> you say, please, can I play up front, even if I'm a woman, actually not even a pro footballer, <laughs> and I say, okay, you know, I'm very good at that, please go and come to sleep also in my place, uh, and in my bed beside my wife. How does this always happen? We always get into naughty topics, but thank you, <laughs> Bayern Valencia, quick one. We have a minute to laugh, wrap this up. It was Put a sport outfit next time. It was. <laughs> I can never wear a sport. <laughs> can, can Bayern Munich actually make it this year? On, you know, on the basis of what we've seen so far, a draw with Valencia, probably fair. What do you think? No. To me, no. Then everything can happen. As is Chelsea won last year, everything can happen. But I think maybe it will be Celtics here. You never the know. Yes, uh, the momentum uh, was, uh, I think, was uh, last year. Uh, and must say that uh, they made it in this way so easily. Actually, they not even struggled that much. If we don't think about uh, what happened against Bath and everything, but anyway, they didn't struggle that much. Uh, and they haven't been, they have been without uh, the, the real top class player they have. Uh, it's Robben that played, if I'm not mistaken, just one game out of five. Also, Einkes is not playing Shakiri, and for me, it's really uh, a blasphemy. But Müller, Thomas Müller, is recovering to the level that he was uh, f three years ago. I think they will be until almost the end but no no it's no more the time i do love how you give me such brief answers to my questions but <laughs> do join us after the break there'll be more champions league action as we'll round up everything that happened on wednesday night hello and welcome back to the world of football show here on sports tonight live now, over the break, basically, Dan Clay is asking me what El Sharawi's haircut looks like, what it's called in English. I don't know. I think it's a mohawk, but 
I don't know. I think it's a, a brush, a brush for the kitchen, you know, when it's like... Oh, like a paintbrush type <laughs> yeah. of thing. Well, perhaps. But anyway, obviously coming back and it's been a, a wonderful, a masterclass by Borussia Dortmund in that match against Ajax. They had six shots, five were on target, four of them were goals. Meanwhile, Ajax, who had 70% possession in the match had attempted six shots on act on target and they only could get one goal what is that they dominated the game in the sense of possession their stats were very effective but there is something about the storm inside that now have blaschikowski back in it as well that just that will just this is one of those relent. cases one of those cases when i like that numbers uh, don't mean anything. nothing about anything about about the game because they are always a, a, some, a good help an indication but you have to watch the reality so uh, it's not that uh, suddenly Ajax is helpless Ajax did what they did against everybody and it's great from the board that he never betrayed his philosophy but the problem is that when they find someone like them but that does the thing three times faster, quicker, and with more quality, the, the quality of uh, uh, Reusch and Goetze that uh, have Lewandowski been was unbelievable. I, but I must say that Lewandowski was the, the cynical converter, but Reusch and Goetze were like, uh, oh guys. The boys who pull the strings. Wow, mamma mia. And uh, even if they have a player that I love, like uh, Sam de Jong, uh, but against this Borussia Dortmund, uh, as we said, uh, the best of this, uh, of this group stage. No. Maybe it's not good for them, because we say in Italy, that uh, who enters the as pope uh, then comes out as cardinal so being in the perfect shape now maybe it's too early yeah you think it's too early i mean majesty and i to know a little bit about that anyway mm -hmm. but do you think that it's a case of you see this is what i mean their type of football everyone said last season is quite impossible to play in the league as well as champions league it is an exhaustive tactic that they do you know they play they press all over the pitch it's running it's team moving back and forth together so you know that's perhaps why they've been stuttering a little bit in the league can Klopp manage to get consecutive victories in the league as well as the Champions League or is it that they play the type of football unlike Bayern Munich that really can't last in both tournaments but it's not only because it's the it's for the kind of football but it's also for the kind of squad I mean uh, Bayern you Munich, think it's squad depth? Bayern Munich got a much deeper squad than, uh, than uh, Borussia Dortmund. Yes, they but they have exact much more control in their tactics, which allows them to sort of take it a little bit easier. It's a different kind of game, but the, if uh, Borussia Dortmund would have some three or four players like the Bayern Munich one ready to stand up from the bench and do... Uh, uh, Bayern Munich can play in uh, Shakiri. Uh, Pizarro, uh, Gomez, Mario Gomez is just out. Mm. They don't have it. We have to remember that Borussia Dortmund, like one, of the, one of the two backbones of Borussia Dortmund is Piszczek, Blachikowski and Lewandowski. The Polish backbone, we all like them a lot. But when these players then went playing the home Euro Championship with Poland, they weren't this great thing. No. So there you see the, how the great job of Klopp uh, is working. But guys, in the end, we can't pretend really uh, have everything. It's already almost a miracle what he's doing. Yes, OK. Let's move on, obviously, to the other game in which, again, Madrid possessed something about 32% of the ball, but exerted most control. And this is the first time they conceded a penalty and got a red card this yeah, season yeah. for them, which I'm sorry, but no matter how many people will tell me that that was a deserved penalty, I didn't see Who it. Who said? Uh, Introduce me wrote. someone that said it was a deserved penalty. I don't want to tell you because I don't want to get it. <laughs> but the newspapers go. The newspapers I was reading were saying, oh, it was a penalty. That was definitely a penalty. No it way. wasn't a penalty, right? No way. Never, 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 never. We just let it down. I think that even and Manchester City were quite happy to get that. And I do think that I think Ronaldo deserved a little few more calls from the referee. I thought they was pushed quite okay, a few Okay, the calls, I, I wouldn't go on the course that, actually I, I think that matter. the referee was very harsh towards Real Madrid yeah I think that the strategy of ball possession was exactly what Mourinho wanted because uh, they were playing away one point was fine mm. counter-attack of Real Madrid is the best in the world yes. when they just play counter-attack I mean the, the way to be straight to the box nobody got like that in yes. the world the thing is that uh, is the Rocky Order picture show as it is called oh, that is what I call Rocky Horror Picture Show. Rocky Horror Picture Show. Gianluca Rocky, the Italian referee. What that a is disaster. a mystery still in Italy. <laughs> Why is still there? I mean, 
this guy, and I don't want to be the usual Italian uh, moaning about referee, but it is an Italian guy. This guy, once every two big games is assigned for, is always doing some mess. The Rocky Order Picture Show is the nickname that was uh, given to him last year after he did everything he could be he could do in uh, an Inter Napoli. And yesterday <laughs> in uh, in um, uh, Manchester uh, in City Real Madrid, it was again the same. The red card. Uh, th there was also this kind of attitude, uh, very. <sighs> Not like someone that wants to put the game under control. No, it's like I want to be the star of the show. I'm really arrogant. Yeah. And I have to and I have to bring you this. Two years two years ago, Inter Milan derby, where last derby with Mourinho on the bench, Inter won one nil in spite of arriving until playing with eight men. So three red cards. Mourinho after the game said was clearly the demonstration that uh, referee Rocky didn't want us to win tonight. <laughs> and do you think that the referee forgot about that words? So you think that's why he was harsh? Ooh, I'm, not say, I'm not saying... No, 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 no wait a moment. No. I'm not saying that he went there uh, to give disadvantage to Real Madrid. But I'm saying that for sure the words were still in his mind. Right. Well, you know what? I would be surprised with Rocky sometimes. Um, it's a shame, though, because, you know, Italian referees, you think of Colina. But let's move on to something a little bit better. This is Schalke, of course, with their 1-0 victory over Olympiacos. And Arsenal just behind with their 2-0 victory over Montpellier. Now, Arsenal were a little bit patchy in the first half. Poor passing. They couldn't find the last, the last trick to get into the goal. But then after the second half, they totally exerted their control. Giroud was great with his layoffs. You know, that's what really Balhanda needed for Montpellier to make Montpellier a much better side. If they had Giroud... And finally, Giroux, a great goal from Podolski. A great so. goal from Podolski. The likes that we would expect from him, no? Yeah, but sooner or later should have come. I mean, <laughs> so, But what about Schalke? Now, they've been doing really well. They defeated Inter not that long ago. And ever since then, in the Champions League, they've been building up and building up. And they have a wonderful, strong, disciplined spine and, and great creative talent on the wing. Are they a side that we should fear in the Champions League? Well, I must say that their group uh, was a bit uh, very friendly because Montpellier was very disappointing mm -hmm. as the French team, well, I, the other one is Lille, have been disappointing in the attitude. Olympiacos went over the expectations because challenge until yesterday, yes. uh, both of them for the qualification. So the great, the great thing they did was against Arsenal. But we know how much Arsenal has struggled in this uh, fall uh, to, to be together again uh, after the, um, Van Persie going away. So I must say it has been a very friendly group. But I believe that as two years ago, when Schalke was uh, this, uh, this blue chip, this team that won win, but they will always play their game, and if they have the chance, they can sell. The good draw, for example, they can sell until the semi-final. I feel that they are still like that. One Raul less, but one Untelar more, that is at the level of the big strikers. Shots really. Ah, I you don't like Kuntler. No, I like him. I just think that firstly, I like him to play alongside another player, and yeah. secondly, I think he ne needs a lot of shots before he converts. But you know, he did play for AC Milan, who have got a three-one victory. Wow, against what a link! Uh, bravissima. <laughs> <laughs> right, I thought so too. You really deserve <laughs> your salary today. <laughs> I really do. I deserve it always, frankly. <laughs> but you know, Anderlecht did have their centre back sent off. Uh, despite that, they still managed to get a goal. What do you think of Milan now? Much better. Berlusconi went to visit them before the weekend, last weekend, and, and you know they did well against Napoli. Maybe deserved more than that one point with their second half performance. Mm. But now three-one victory. They did nothing really in the first half. Let's be honest. Yeah, <laughs> nothing. Okay. Anderlecht absolutely battered them. Absolutely. <laughs> so, I was like watching that, and I remember that uh, game that they played against Anderlecht five years ago, where they won uh, uh, one nil. But with Kaka scoring, but it was something like, okay, we are Milan, we know that sooner or later we are going to sort this out. It was something like, wow, <laughs> it's one century, it's really one century that passed by. did nothing. The visit of Berlusconi. And what, what did happen to Maxess? Maxess cut his uh, mohawk yeah. haircut. And after that, I mean, last Sunday, uh, no, sorry, not sorry, last Sunday, two, uh, two Sundays ago, he hit a fantastic post with an incredible Bekiel just after conceding an absolutely stupid goal. And this time... A wonderful back, 
Uh, well, you were just uh, saying something <laughs> very harsh, but for makes sense, I can allow that. There is one song uh, lately that is going on in Italy. But it was it's a wonderful goal of, of his. It was yeah. It's about this, this song that is uh, uh, one video game, I won't say the name, uh, the, the most famous video game about football. Uh, that is doing the, the rhyme with Maxess, no? Mm -hmm. You can understand so. And they talk about uh, smoking a joint and then playing with Maxess and playing this video game. That fantasy, that craziness yesterday in Maxess, someone gave him the joy because seriously, I don't know from where it was coming <laughs> that from. Or this is from for gallery of uh, history of football, the, what he did. But as you said, first time Milan absolutely battered. At least they are through. But if they think that is, uh, is That's enough. enough, no way, absolutely not. They're news for you, it. news for you. Last week, as long as Berlusconi is back on control, last week uh, Berlusconi spoke with Florentino Perez. Uh -huh. They are trying to convince Real Madrid to have on loan Albiol, yeah. Carvalho and Kaká. And Kaká. Well, you never know. They have a great friendship going. But just before everything, and we wrap this up, PSG, Lavezzi is the one with the brace. As if Finally, as at least Lavezzi. Yes, and I think he's a fabulous player, so I'm glad he sort of you know, started to shine a little bit there. Um, actually, he's been doing all right for a while now. Um, so what do you think about PSG and Porto? Did you think that they, Porto would come first in that group? Uh, to me, Porto is the fifth best team of this group stage uh, so far. Oh. But they have just one point more than PSG and they will play at Parc de Prince. And I think so. And I think so that uh, even if PSG didn't play so good like them, uh, I think that they can uh, steal the first spot of the last, uh, the last fixture. Wow, OK. Well, I don't know about that, but... Uh, By the Ibrahimovic factor. Even yesterday, he played like he was playing in Milan, like number 10. Amazing. He just, he just opens it. everything, space. Uh, it's a wonderful player. Only, in my opinion, only Ronaldo and Messi are better. But do join us after Boom. the break. We know the first... Boom. We know the top three teams in his eyes, <laughs> and we know the fifth is Porto. So who's the fourth? Join us after the break, and you'll find out. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the World Football Show here on Sports Tonight Live. Now, just before the break, we told you who uh, Dan Grady's top five teams are, but we didn't know who was in fourth place, so just quickly tell us. Malaga, Malaga, Malaga. Of course they would be Malaga. They conceded two, though, so I'm not sure about that. Anyway, let's, let's move on to another continent, shall we? And we'll go over to South America, where Brazil beat Argentina on penalties for the Super Classico wow, de las Wow, was Americas. that the final of Copa America? No. <laughs> was that World Cup? No. Well, I don't know. What We're going to have to ask John Cottrell. John Cottrell from Goal TV is here with us today. Hello, John. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about this cup and whether or not it loses its appeal because of the lack of European stars obviously playing in it yesterday? Well, it's, it's a really old traditional cup. It started as the Copa Hawker back in 1914 and then discontinued in 1976. And then last year, it started again between Brazil and Argentina and they call it the Super Classico de Americas, which is the, the super derby of the Americas, really. Uh, Brazil were up 2-1 from the first leg in Goiania. They tried to play a game a few weeks ago back in Argentina, but they had floodlight problems. So the two teams are there, but two teams on the pitch, floodlight problems, they, they cancelled the game, and then it was rescheduled for last night in the Bombonera, which is the first time Brazil have actually ever played there. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> that's the first time ever in history, and they managed, Argentina managed to win 2-1, and the game went to penalties, and Brazil won on penalties. Uh, but there are, you know, there's a lot of empty seats in this stadium, and as you said, you know, the lack of... Uh, Argentines especially who are based in Europe because it was only Brazil and Argentine players who were allowed to play in this game. It, it does take a, a lot of a shine off this kind of fixture, which some see as rather unnecessary considering that Brazil have a very, very packed schedule. Mm -hmm. They're preparing for the Confederations Cup next year, in the World Cup, of course, and they can't use their full squad. And also, I think, I mean, it's the, it's the end uh, of, the, of the season in, uh, in Brazil, but still the Brasileirao is not finished uh, so i don't know it's like i mean what a very weird scheduling at least at least weird 
Absolutely, yeah. And also Brazil, as far as I'm aware, is the only country which actually runs its league while there are FIFA dates. So Brazil, <laughs> uh, Brazil and suffer when Brazil are playing. And this year, of course, they've played a lot of friendlies. They have the Olympics. And teams like uh, Santos losing Neymar. Neymar's hardly played any games at all for uh, Santos in the league. So it really, really does affect some of the clubs. And there are always calls to change the, the league season here because basically we start... There's a, there's a junior team competition, which is broadcast live here, a big competition called the San Paolo Juniors Cup, and that starts on the 2nd of January. And then the local state leagues, which involve all the big clubs, they start around uh, mid-January, and then the Copa de Brazil kicks in, and the Libertadores, and the Sul Americana, and the Brasilia Rao. There's no break, basically, from mid-January until early December. John, I, I like that you mentioned that you mentioned about uh, uh, Neymar, because there was a TV commentator, Paul Saras, yesterday, that tweeted, correct me if I'm wrong, that, uh, is, that yesterday was the game number 70 in 2012 that uh, Neymar played. Is it right? It could be right. It wouldn't surprise me. He never misses a game. Neymar wants to play every single game. He's never injured or rarely injured. He doesn't get many suspensions. He's going to miss the Corinthians match at the, uh, on the Sunday, Saturday, in fact. But uh, he, he wants to play. He plays for Brazil one day, and then he jets back into uh, the, the country, and he plays for uh, Santos the next day. OK, He's so what, what is uh, the rhythm of these games uh, are uh, already uh, at a lower level for Neymar? Uh, is a Superman, or this is going to affect him uh, very hardly in the next future? I, I think personally that there could be burnout when he gets a bit older. He genetically, we did a we did a special on him for our Foot Brazil magazine show, and genetically he is suited to recover very very quickly once he's played a game. He's exhausted at the end of the game, but within 12 hours he's totally totally fit. Uh, the levels of uh, hormones in his blood are back to uh, a very very high level, and he can go on and he can perform within 12 hours of playing a game very very easily. So he has a genetic thing. He has a fabulous talent. That's the other thing. And it stays clear of injuries. My God, if I actually walk less than a mile, I need about 24 hours to recover. So God knows how <laughs> he does that. But um, John, let me move on just uh, quickly, because, of course, the last time we spoke to you, there was that controversial incident with Palmeiras, and now they've been relegated. So how does it feel in Brazil to have one of the greatest clubs, you know, in their history relegated? Well, I mean... As far as Palmeiras are concerned, they went down 10 years ago. So they're, they're not that they're used to going down, but they went down <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, and the man who put them down, Wagner Lovey, as he's as called, he scored an equaliser for Flamengo. Palmeiras had to win the remaining three games to stand any chance of, of staying up and also rely on other, other results. They drew one apiece at Flamengo. Uh, Wagner Lovey, a man who scored lots of goals for Palmeiras in Serie B, the second division, he scored the equaliser for Flamengo. Results elsewhere sent Palmeiras down. As you said, they are one of the giants. They've won a lot of competitions here. They won the Libertadores here as well under Philippe Pau back in the 90s. Philippe Pau was the coach at Palmeiras for the last year and a half. Yeah. Many see him as being responsible for sending Palmeiras down to the second division. His, his record in the league was atrocious. Four wins, five draws and 15 losses. But because of his huge salary, Palmeiras really couldn't afford to get rid of him. He was, I think, the 11th best coach in the world, which for Brazilian standards is, is very, very high indeed. Um, you mentioned the, the Hand of God incident involving Hernan Barcas, who actually played for Argentina last night against Brazil. Well, the, the result of that game was International 2, Palmeiras 1. Palmeiras complained because they alleged that some of the officials had looked at replays on TV monitors and saw that Barcas has handled the ball. It would have been 2-2. Two -two. It went to a sports tribunal and they voted nine uh, judges to zero that the result would stand. Um, everyone knew that was going to happen anyway because uh, there was no proof what had happened on, on the pitch and no one could say whether the officials had used uh, TV video or not. Right, OK, thank you so much for your, your roundup, John. But I do have to, unfortunately, let you go. Um, but hopefully we can speak to you a little bit later and I, as we find out how Brazil are getting along with all their preparations. Um, okay.
Thank you for that. Let's move on to MLS because, of course, there's all this news of uh, now David Beckham leaving LA. <gasps> what does that mean for Posh? Anyway, that's not what we're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> that's what I have to talk about. Yeah, with that here, she can walk everywhere. That's not a problem. That is indeed. That, uh, so, but honestly speaking, there's lots of rumours now with other people leaving to the MLS, him leaving. Does this say something about the MLS? It, you know, as in they're getting all these stars that sort of only go there when they're a bit retired. You mentioned Lampard it's, earlier. It's saying uh, exactly what we knew already and that didn't change. I mean, uh, the pace in MLS is really like of uh, these old horses uh, that go to retire uh, just somewhere. Uh, the, the news, uh, I think that... Uh, it's not more the Beckham that went to Milan two years ago that I, I, f I think that was still competitive, for example, to play in a World Cup. But, you know, a Beckham in a PSG could still fit, even if... Really? Yes, I, this guy... But also, do they really need another attacking no, midfielder? No, they, no, of course they don't need Beckham. But, you know, if you have Beckham and he's a, still is one of the best cross deliverer in the world. Yes, yes. So if you, when you are desperate and you have something like 15 minutes, is the guy saying, okay, you know, maybe he can give one or two crosses that are good. But yesterday, Leonardo from Passagio said that we are not interested in Beckham. Mm, let's see. Well, let's see. Luckily for us, we've got Joe Prince right on the phone with us, who is our MLS expert. Um, hello, Joe, can you hear us? Yeah, loud and clear. How are you guys doing? Perfect, thank you. So what is it about these rumours? So Leonardo has come out to say that they're not interested in Beckham. Where He is leaving LA, so where do you think he's going? Well, to be honest, there's a lot of rumours over in the US that he was going to stay and play for the New York Cosmos, but that doesn't really seem like it's going to pan out because they're uh, joining the NASL, which is the second tier over there. So for a few years, they won't be an MLS team. So honestly, the, the indications we're getting is that he's going to head to Australia. Um, and I think that'd be a great move for Beckham. Um, it's very similar to the MLS five or six years ago when he first went out there. And the likes of, you know, Del Piero and Emil Hesky being there, he's kind of going along the same lines as them to try and raise the profile in Australia. So with Paris now out of the question, I think Australia is the most likely destination. Joe, the fact that Eric Cantona is at the New York Cosmos can maybe help the transfer? It could, but... To be honest, for, for this season, they're going to be playing at a high school stadium in Long Island and they're going to be playing in the NASL. So I can't see Beckham dropping down that level, playing in front of crowds of three or 4,000, which they probably will get. Uh, I think in a couple of years' time, if he's still playing, maybe, that would be an option. But I think it just really should be ruled out the question right now. But you never know in the future. He's got a clause in his MLS contract uh, about being an owner of the team and he's already said he's going to exercise that whether that's with the New York Cosmos or another new franchise. Um, he's definitely going to be in and around America for the foreseeable future. Right. Okay. Joe, what about his replacement for the team? Will they be having to find someone else who can possibly give what Beckham gives? Fla Frank Lampard has been mentioned as a possible replacement. Jerry Alleywell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think Lampard is, is all for being there. From what we've heard, the reports we've heard, the deal was almost close to being done. The only stumbling block is whether Lampard is going to come in January during a transfer window or he wants to see out the end of the season with Chelsea. I don't know how that changes now with Benitez coming in, uh, whether Lampard's role at Chelsea is going to be improved, more playing time when he comes back from injury. But yeah, everyone in LA wants to see Lampard there. He, he would take up a big chunk of the DP money, which Beckham will be leaving behind, which is another big factor with MLS with the salary caps and everything else involved. So I think Lampard, but also Didier Drogba and even Kaká have come out in the last month or so and said how they admire what the MLS is doing as a league and you know with their franchises. So maybe a few of those bigger names will come for the 2013 season, and that would be a great legacy that Beckham has left behind. The likes of those guys, Drogba and Kaká, are even contemplating coming to MLS is something that Beckham's brought to the league. Right. Okay. What about the state of the MLS now? Do you think that with you know? sort of always being associated to these stars that come to the end of their, how do you say, their careers really in, in, in the UK, in the Premier League, in Italy or in Spain, then move on to MLS. I mean, when are they actually going to start going for players who are at their peak? Seems you're going to talk about elephants that want to die far away <laughs> from the people. Oh dear, this is terrible. I, I mean, to be honest, it, it should really have happened a few years ago that younger players are going at it, but you're seeing the likes of the Montreal Impact are taking Alessandro Nesta, Marco Davio. They're going over there now in 
the uh, twilight of their career, you should say. But it's very interesting. Uh, the New York Red Bulls are trying to get younger international um, hungry guys from, from Europe to come over, but it's not as easy um, to do. Um, just purely the fact that they're trying to grow the U.S. game as well. They're trying to get as many young U.S. players involved, and there's restrictions on the number of foreign players you can have in the MLS. Yeah. So, you know, for them just to have the two or three marquee signings who are going to bring in it's a huge minute. amount of money from, from shirt sales, that's going to be the main thing for MLS clubs to do. Right. Thank you so much for joining us, Joe. It was a pleasure having you on. Um, but do join us after the break, where we'll he be heading back to Europe to discuss news in brief. See you then. Hello and welcome back to the World of Football show here on Sports Tonight Live. Now we move on to the man who broke the story about all the fan trouble that happened yesterday night between Lazio and Tottenham Hotspur's fans. Yeah. Now tell us a little bit more about that. What's going on? It's just a shame and it's disgusting. Uh, we can't still uh, talk about fan trouble because still is not clear if it was uh, from uh, Lazio, fa Lazio Ultras, I would say, it would be offending to call them Lazio fans, these are criminals. If it was from Lazio Ultras, for someone uh, trying to, be, to pretend to be kind of Ultras, or it is even for that could be a kind of uh, connection between different kind of Ultras. Why? Because Tottenham is the club that is uh, connected with the Jewish roots and everything, so for anti-Semitic reasons. It's just, it's really disgusting. What happened is that uh, in this very popular uh, pub, English pub, in the very center of, uh, of Roma, three weeks ago I was in that pub when I was in Roma, because it's the place where usually the Erasmus hang out, uh, they do the pub rides. Well, the Anglo-Saxon, when they go to Roma, they, they just uh, hang, hang out there. there yeah. So by one o'clock in the night, people were there, wasn't not even that atmosphere that there is when the English fans go abroad so they drink too much, they are too loud, was not even like that, was not even like that. 40 men, around 40 men with motorbike helmets, with bats, someone with knives, arrived in the bar, they start to destroy everything until part of the uh, of the people that were in the bar that couldn't recognize couldn't spot as Tottenham fans left and they were let's say allowed to leave instead the Tottenham uh, people stayed there other fans were outside the bar preventing that they couldn't let uh, they, they couldn't leave the place they beat them up uh, 10 of them went to hospital two of them one of them uh, is uh, in uh, serious condition because was stabbed. Uh, it's not confirmed, but apparently he was stabbed here oh, beside the neck. And this thing, uh, uh, it will, it's a, a long talk. Can I say I'm so ashamed and so bothered and tired that every time that is about Italy, I have to hear, oh, why in Italy these things happen no. still? It's not I about just... Italia, it's not about that. It's about that there is a political, a, no, a political not will to solve this problem once in a while. Because these people uh, always, in some way, they find a way, some political side, uh, and some way out, some escape, because uh, if they are 40 person at one o'clock in the middle of the night, but in the middle of Rome, it's impossible in 2012 that you can spot each one of them. Mm. It's absolutely impossible. No, you're right, you're right. And unfortunately, football is being uh, used for political reasons far too often that we like. But speaking of political, Berlusconi owns Milan, That's Milan a play, issue. Milan play page and Juve, moving. and we're trying to go on to a more positive note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the great game that thing. will be Milan Juventus. Milan Juventus. Now we'll both be in the match, and it's going oh, to. Oh yes! Be... What a connection! What a connection! Give me this camera. These two persons, Stadio San Siro, Sunday night, both there at the press box watching Milan Juventus. What that will be, no, and no, what no. after the no, stadium no. will happen, actually. I'll be in the director's boss, but anyway. Ooh, <laughs> like Ronaldinho. <laughs> Damn straight. Ooh. Right, let's talk about this game. Do you think that it will be an easy one for you, V? Or do you think Milan no. will really rev themselves up for this match? Not even that. <laughs> Won't be easy for Juve, 
because uh, wow the chelsea game maybe took a lot out of them maybe was the most demanding of all this year and a half uh, yes of uh, antonio conte uh, Squad. Uh, juventus uh, also demanding year in mind i mean uh, he really sucked out all the energy from them <laughs> but, <Satya Vidal. laughs> but I, i must say that anyway milan we saw what happened with underlecht uh, the, the the few strengths that they could put there they put it there honestly i think that juventus will struggle but in the last 20 25 minutes they will make it look at the defense and still of, of do you milan. think there'll be squad rotation then do you think the likes of jacarini will play do Shelly will play and isla will play Just the chain yet no because uh, still uh, got so, do su such childish defensive mistakes that is not so reliable but Giaccherini might. He got uh, some stamina that could be really needed Pogba? on Sunday. Uh, Pogba means that you have to rule out one between Marchisio, Vidal and, uh, and uh, Pirlo, of course. And pff, what, a, what, what a decision I is that? I think Vidal needs a time round. No, of course he needs. Maybe he would make one half both. I yes, know. that's a good idea. But uh, any predictions? Prediction? I go for... Uh, 1-2 for Juventus. Mm, right, okay. Now let's move on just very briefly. Remember um, that mm. two weeks ago you asked me a prediction for the group stage uh, of Champions League uh, uh, of Juventus. said, who will qualify? I said, Shakhtar first and Juventus second. You forgot about that. Oh my God, I did forget about that. <laughs> but you now you remember, that? no? Yes, you Mamma said Mamma mia. Mia. Wait, hold on. They still have to get a point and, and yeah, Dan yeah, Bass yeah, Arena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Biscotto, no, if you know. Oh, <laughs> after we complain so much about Sweden and Denmark, then we, we start making deals of our own. And you know what we'll say? Oh, you obey back to their ways. You obey back <laughs> to their ways. You know, anyway, um, <laughs> I do remember. Never mind, I'm not even going to go into that. Klaas Jan Huntela is sort of the only player everyone keeps talking about. Where will he go? Will it be Liverpool? That was the first team that was associated to him. Nah. Will it be Arsenal? Do they have the money? Or will it be Juventus? With most people tweeting me, why on earth would he go to Serie A? Yes, of course, why on earth? What do you think? I think that to take Huntela, they have to break the budget. Who, Juventus? Yes. Mm -hmm. And, okay, everything is possible. If Chelsea won last Champions League, uh, everything is possible. But I just say, if you didn't break the budget for Van Persie, why now you decide to do it on January for Yeah, but surely he's not going to cost you as much as Robin Van Persie. But it's going to cost anyway a lot. Not, not less <laughs> than, si well, than you want 16 a world -class millions striker. of euros of salary per year, 8 million uh, the salary, 8 million the taxes. Plus, you want to give some tips of uh, 15 or 20 millions of euros to Schalke? I don't know. Well, you know what? You want a world-class striker, then you have to take out your wallet and actually pay for a world-class striker. So who is he going for? I really don't know, but it seems like no one has money. They want Thank us you. in the show, they have to pay us a lot. So Thank it's, you it's for joining us on the show. I shall see you in Italy. But as for you guys, we'll see you next week, same time, same place, same football chat. See you then.